Thank you for joining us for Imagine, the New World of Education, a series of online conversations with thought leaders centered on tackling the challenges education institutions are facing across the globe right now. Over the next several months, we will explore best practices around learning continuity, virtual working and learning, building business resiliency in the cloud, and more with Amazon Web Services, AWS, customers that have leveraged the cloud during this unprecedented time. I'm Ann Marihu, Director of US Higher Education at AWS. Today, I'm joined by Scott Pulsifer, President, Western Governors University. Western Governors University, WGU, is an online university where students earn an affordable, accredited, career-focused college degree at an accelerated pace. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you mind starting things off by telling us a little bit about WGU and how the institution has transformed over the years? Sure, and it's great to be with you, and thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this. It's truly a pleasure. You know, WGU has uh, been in existence now for a little over 20 years. Uh, uh, you know, at, at WGU, we believe in the power of human potential, and we probably also uh, convey our core belief in most of what we do, which is that we believe in the inherent worth and ability of every individual. And we know that, uh, you know, given the opportunity, every person has something big to contribute. And this was at the root of WG's founding. Uh, it was in fact founded by the governors of 19 Western states. Um, they uh, recognized that there are too many individuals and residents within their respective states that did not have access to high quality post-secondary education and the pathways to opportunity. And so they recognized that this gap that existed between talent and opportunity was quite wide. And so they uh, wisely, I think, innovated a new private nonprofit institution that became WGU. Uh, and for our now over 20 years, we've endeavored to improve quality and expand access and, and truly optimize student success for every individual that we serve. And, and so even though we're only uh, you know, 20, let's see, 23 years young, we were founded in 1997, today, uh, WGU serves nearly 125,000 students uh, in all 50 states and also on base, military bases overseas. Um, uh, more importantly, uh, we just surpassed our 200,000th graduate. Uh, and uh, it's truly remarkable to consider kind of the scope and scale that, uh, that WG, WGU has been able to grow into as, as we endeavor to uh, make education and opportunity work for everyone. That's fantastic, Scott. I know I've heard so many meaningful stories of how WGU has made a difference in people's lives, and it, it truly is an honor to be able to work with you and see the great work that WGU is doing and changing people's lives. You know, I understand that you testified to Congress recently about higher education is coping with COVID. Can you share a summary of the points that you made? Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting experience for sure. As uh, you might imagine, there are many sectors that have been impacted by COVID. Um, and there is uh, there is little doubt that higher education has been one of those ones that have been impacted quite broadly. Um, and so the, the event itself on, you know, how stimulus funding might be needed to uh, to support the higher education sector and uh, in many ways to, to address issues of revenue loss uh, for many institutions that now be, may be str struggling with their economics and their budgets. And, and, you know, my testimony essentially said that, you know, you're solving for the wrong problem. You know, if we're only going to think about how to create funding and, and federal stimulus to prop up uh, our legacy model of things, then, then that would probably be akin to investing in malls in the year 2000. Um, and so my focus of my testimony was really about how do you uh, address many of the pre-existing uh, conditions that existed within a higher education? How do you stimulate investment and, and, uh, and innovation that's desperately needed to address challenges with affordability, uh, massive equity issues, and arguably uh, less than stellar student outcome measures and student success measures? 
And so my my primary points to the questions I was being asked was how should the federal government or even state governments or any funding, if you will, direct funding that's desperately needed to drive innovation and the technology that's needed for the future of learning? Uh, how do you think about advancing our ability to access and enable the individuals that are poorly served or underserved by traditional models? And so we need to use the pressure, if you will, of the pandemic to kind of catalyze this reinvention of higher education. You know, we truly need to renew higher education as the surest path to opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I so appreciate your perspective on this. I'm just curious, how do we do that? How do we make education the surest path to opportunity? Yeah, you know, I think uh, there are some uh, there are some themes surely that WGU could inform there. And I think one of the first and probably the most important one is for education to be the surest path to opportunity. It surely needs to be a path that aligns with that opportunity and to be more specific about mm -hmm. that that we need to think about how learning and the credentials and the outcomes of education in fact are relevant and aligned with uh, the future of work um, uh, we well know that the vast majority of those who matriculate into post-secondary programs they're doing so so that they can find a great first job or even next job so that they can advance the their prospects uh, in their in their own lives and so uh, we also need to think about what that looks like in the current environment. You know, when we have this massive challenge of over 15 million Americans who are currently unemployed and they know that the jobs they have before are not going to be ones that are available for them to go back to. So how do we upskill millions of displaced workers and help them prepare for the new opportunities? Um, this probably, I would say, emphasizes something we often talk about, which is education has to be uh, the pathway for not only the first opportunity, which is what most of us know, you know, first time full time students who are 18 year olds who get their, you know, you know, bachelor's credential or otherwise. But we also have to be thinking about how post secondary education enables individuals in pursuing their next opportunity. Um, it really advances the notion of a lifelong learner. How does education and work weave together through an individual's life? that this is not one, you know, one and done model, it's actually a multiple iteration model of life. Um, lastly, I probably the, would emphasize that, that the opportunity, the pathway of education has to work for everyone. Um, if you look at enrollment today, it's surely unbalanced toward individuals of high income households. The attainment rates vary greatly across those different backgrounds. Uh, over the last 50 years, we've seen dramatic notable increases in attainment rates among the top income quartile of households, but among the bottom income quartile of households, they've remained relatively stagnant. Even if access and enrollment's gone up, the reality is, is the outcome isn't there yet. And so I think we have to be investing to figure out how to ensure that there is equal probability, not only in accessing these education pathways, but also equal probability of outcome. And so how do we think as institutions and those in the sector, how do we think about you know, orienting everything we do and how we deliver it, how we teach, how we engage with students. How do we uh, personalize? This is something Amazon knows well uh, a lot about. Like, how do we personalize the learning so we can dramatically increase the probability that every individual can be successful and then put on their path to their opportunity? Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I think you brought up a great point there that this is not just about the students who are 18 to 22 years old. This right. is about students who are coming, whatever age they are, back into wanting to learn something new and be productive in the workforce. So it's clear we have big problems. How can higher ed address those? Yeah, the uh, just on that point too, Anne, uh, there's something that often is not known about enrollment today, that even 40% of the 20 million or so adults enrolled in higher education are over the age of 24. And it's the fastest growing age demographic too. And so this is already happening, even if not all institutions have woken up to that. Um, it is already happening as they see post-secondary education uh, being more critical as not just the first opportunity, but the next rung on the ladder of one's life. So, you know, how, how can higher ed address these? You know, uh, one thing that we often think about is like, you know, scale does matter. Um, we've in many ways created this uh, sense of false you know, scarcity or that somehow we've constrained capacity and so then we use selective admissions criteria, et cetera. And, and uh, this would be akin to Amazon saying to the next prime customer to say, sorry, I just want to let you know now that you're the 
100 million than one you know, prime customer, your service is going to be less than the, all the 100 million that came before you. Like, that's not true. It's not true in higher education either. So when we are facing issues of inequity or lack of opportunity, like we do have to address this at quite a large scale. You know, in the U.S. alone, there are 40 to 50 million adults who need access to, to their next opportunity. And education has to be one of those pathways that they have to think about. The other thing I would say is arguably a mental shift uh, in most of the higher education sector. And, and I say this as, as an outsider who's come into higher education. Uh, so much of this perception that we have is that higher ed is oriented around the professoriate, you know, the faculty, you know, that, that it's about advancing research and knowledge, et cetera. When we take a very different approach at WGU, and this is something I think would benefit the sector as a whole, is how do we really put the student at the center of everything that we do. Like they are the primary customer of higher education. If, if one of the primary purposes is to transfer knowledge and the skills and capabilities to individuals so they could advance their lives, then that requires us to put the student at the center of everything we do to drive our innovation, the solutions that we come up with. How do we think about you know, leveraging technology? How do we think about faculty engagement? How do we think about content and curriculum design? When you put the student at the center of everything you do, you might redesign things in higher education very differently than they are today. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about what you said about scale and how important that is. And in an article that you authored, this was published by Forbes in July, you said, and I quote, the higher education sector is in the throes of technology-driven disruption, a disruption irreversibly accelerated by COVID-19. Can you share more about all the ways you're seeing this disruption? Yeah, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, that's definitely one of the benefits I have too is coming into higher education, especially from a technology sector and background is that mm -hmm. technology is a catalyst for innovation and change. And uh, technology is enabling uh, you know, different thinking and different modeling in pretty much every aspect of higher education. You can just look at right now, like how do we deliver content and learning to students? How do we engage at a one-to-one -one basis between faculty members and students? How do we think about developing learning management systems and learning environments? How do we connect students and peers at, that are working at a distance rather than on a campus in a classroom? How do we think about even financial aid? And how do we think about the, uh, you know, the engagement of employers or internships? Like, Technology is something that can enable pretty much a, uh, an advancement of the design of everything that we do in higher education. And so technology, interestingly enough, can address major gaps uh, that are affected by things like affordability and cost or equity. Uh, but now, for example, distance education or delivering learning online, we start to emphasize two other digital inequities or the digital divide that exists too. And so uh, we can identify how we invest in digital infrastructure to increase access by having high, you know, high bandwidth internet access in everyone's home so they can not just shop and, and bank and everything else, but they can also engage learning and enroll in programs and in, interact with faculty, et cetera. And so um, at the end of the day, technology can, uh, can find solutions for students and design the end-to-end -end journey uh, in a way that we just didn't think about it before. Um, and that's why it's been so important for us to really rely upon AWS as one of our key technology partners. Because when you can in instrument the entire journey end to end, you start producing a massive amount of data and content and transactions and all these interactions, you start exposing into a highly technology and data rich environment. Well, you truly then need a, also a platform that can scale and enable what we need to do with technology. Yeah, I love I love the idea of that it's end to end because that's really akin to what the student is going through. Instead of piecemealing, it really is from the beginning to the end. What is everything they need to be successful? Can you give us a few examples of your technology driven approach? Where are you seeing this come out? Where does technology help you on that end to end platform? Yeah, the uh, um, maybe two uh, specific things I could think about really quickly. We have this general notion of free the data, you know, because when you're instrumenting everything with technology from the end-to-end -end student journey, you start producing all that information. Well, we actually want to free up that data 
so that we can start analyzing the impacts of different innovations or changes that we make in the student's journey. Everything from the content they use uh, to learn a subject in a, a course to how they interact with a you know in a with faculty in a particular way. And so we've embraced the power of data and metrics. Um, I will share just one anecdote uh, of something I carried with me from my Amazon days into WGU, which is this phrase of, if we can know, we should know. And so that, that's kind of been this mantra of like, well, when you have this technology instrumented end-to-end -end journey, you have to then acquire all the data, do the analysis of it, track the reporting and metrics so that you can actually know whether things are working. So that leads me to the next key point, which is, we do utilize technology to run randomized controlled trials. Um, does this content increasing learning versus this content? Does the sequencing of courses improve progress versus this sequencing of courses? Does this faculty interaction increase you know, uh, persistence and completion and, and first time you know, uh, success on the first assessment? Like, how do we actually know what we're doing is impacting student success? And that's something that uh, with a technology enabled model, that we can advance in a way that uh, that a non-tech rich or a analog model would struggle to do. And so you do really need these highly scalable, highly available cloud solutions to rely upon when you're committing to this tech first approach to designing uh, for students. And so that's again, back to like utilizing AWS has not only uh, improved our availability and scalability, et cetera, but it's really, maximize our ability to adapt to students' needs on a one-by-one -one basis. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with the fact that with COVID now, so many universities have had to employ technology whether they want to or not. And I'm wondering how would you grade higher ed's COVID-driven move online? What, what should online learn, learning look like? Yeah. Um, uh, much of what I think we are seeing in the first iteration of uh, most institutions who've tried to advance an online or hybrid model is that it's something that would be like 15 years ago. You know, we we basically said, how do we get at least a broadcast mode working? Because mm -hmm. arguably most of what we experienced in a classroom was a lecture model. You know, the lecture was just part of the content we consumed to try to master the the uh, subject matter of a particular course. And so most of the initial iterations of that were like, well, how do we turn a lecture on the stage into a lecture online? And, and uh, we have to go well beyond this broadcast mode, though. You know, high quality online learning and teaching really requires us or really empowers us to think about things like time. Um, just think about the nature of how a credit hour model, class based model worked before is you had classes scheduled at a certain time. But if now the content can be consumed whenever I want to consume it, or I need to have access to faculty and teaching assistants when I need to have access to teaching assistants, like it, it now changes the construct of time to favor the individual who's consuming it rather than I have to be at a certain place. We have to think about uh, you know, relationships between individuals very differently and how to utilize technology to enable study groups and peer-based learning and sharing of, you know, uh, of notes even, or, more importantly, faculty. Um, I often like to talk about faculty role online is kind of like having 24 seven office hours because you can record your content, but that becomes just, you know, consume when you want. It's really about how does the one-to-one -one teaching happen? And that you know, occurred with TAs and, and faculty in office hours. Well, you now have to do that at fairly uh, a high rate uh, and making yourself available. So lastly, of course, the data. How do we utilize data in totally new ways? And so if you believe in the mission-driven nature of higher education, then you have to design for that mission as we go into a tech-first mindset or into an online uh, model. So it's, it's one of those things that, uh, that we're very excited about how technology is gonna enable significant advancements in higher ed that we haven't seen in the last several decades. Yeah, we're we're very excited for you and and certainly we want to support that in every way that we can. You know, it's interesting as much as nostalgia that we have for our past, we as individuals and humans, we've shown our resiliency to invent for our future. How do we embrace this future together? Yeah. Um that's a great question. You know, I think one of the first things that I recall having this conversation uh with someone about whether the technology learning model is is you know better or worse than the kind of in-person learning model. And 
And the reality is, is that's the wrong question. You know, um, it's really about how do we leverage technology to enable everything and advance everything. And so I'm trying to think about aspects of my life today that are somehow worse because of tech, when in reality, our lives are arguably better today because of technology. It doesn't mean it doesn't come with certain challenges. Um, it, but, you know, think about shopping, think about banking, think about travel, you know, like think about even engaging and staying connected with, you know, family and peers and friends. Like, there's hardly an example I can think of where technology made things worse. And so I think we have to think about how does, you know, how do we leverage technology to catalyze the disruption and innovation and ultimately the change that we need to bring about so that education is more accessible, it's more equitable, it's more personalized, it's more aligned with the future of work. Like we can, how do we leverage technology? The key question is how do we leverage technology to advance in any one of those dimensions I, I, I mentioned? So we should recognize the way that we used to do things isn't the way we will continue to do things. And so we're the ones that are gonna make that change. It's not like we're gonna, we should be sitting around for someone else to do it and then force it upon us. It's how are we proactive about leveraging technology to bring about the change that we, that our students and our, and our, and the workforce and our future society needs from higher education. Yeah, it's also interesting, isn't it? Because I think that if you talk to any student, the students are expecting it. They, they see this in their lives and they want it. They're used to it now. So oh, yeah. um, I think it's a call to all of us to, to be able to meet their needs. And I loved when you said that, you know, just because this is how we did it doesn't mean that's how we should be doing it. So Scott, yeah. you know, I think we can all agree you've given us a lot to think about. I want to thank you for joining me to discuss WGU's transformation and to give your perspective on education amidst a very uncertain fall. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you for listening in. We hope that you'll register for the rest of our Imagine webinar sessions that are happening throughout the fall. And when you register, you'll be notified whenever we have a new session to share. Thanks again. We hope you see, to see you all soon. And thanks again, Scott, for your time today. Thank you so much.